Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to Episode 7 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. On June 1st, 1785, King George III received his first diplomat from the United States after recognizing its independence in April 1784. That American statesman was John Adams, one of the most vocal revolutionaries to serve in the Continental Congress and one of the three Americans to negotiate and sign the Treaty of Paris 1783, which ended the war for American independence. Adams had done a lot between 1774 and 1783 to anger King George III, which may make you wonder what happened when His Majesty came face to face with John Adams. In this episode, we will explore the life of John Adams, United States Minister to Great Britain, and the world of documentary editing with Sarah Giorgini, Assistant Editor at the Adams Papers Editorial Project. During our conversation, Sarah will reveal what a documentary editing project is, more about the work documentary editors perform, and how their efforts help us to better understand the people, places, and events of the past, and she will illustrate the benefits of documentary editing projects by providing us with insight into John Adams' experiences as the first United States Minister to Great Britain a post he served in between 1785 and 1788. And of course, those insights will include what happened when John Adams met King George III. But first, I would like to take a moment and wish you and your family a happy Thanksgiving. I hope you enjoy good weather, great food, and the wonderful company of your friends and family. Okay, let's get to our conversation with Sarah. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us today is Sarah Giorgini, an assistant editor at the Adams Papers Editorial Project, which is based in the Massachusetts Historical Society. In January 2015, Sarah will graduate with a Ph.D. in history from Boston University. Her dissertation is entitled, Household Gods, Creating Adams Family Religion, 1583 to 1927. Sarah has authored two published essays on the topic of religious history, and she is a co-founder of and contributor to the early American history blog, The Junto, which can be found at earlyamericanists.com. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Sarah. Thanks, Liz. I'm glad to be here. So before we dive into our interview today, we should probably acknowledge the fact that we've known each other for I guess it's over three years now. It is. The world of early Americanists, particularly Omohundro conferences, has been great about bringing us back together. Sheer too, I think. Right. So um, Sarah's referring to the um, two history conferences for early American historians. One is done by the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, based out of uh, William and Mary College in Williamsburg, Virginia. And the second is the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic. But I think we met at a Humahundro conference, right? I think that's right. Yes, we had a a similar interest in how early American people dealt with their national identity and frameworks, especially when they were abroad. Yeah, that was a fun conference. I think it was in New Paltz, which is an interesting place. Yeah, it was. New Paltz, New York. Mm -hmm. Um. But one interesting detail that I learned in New Paltz that I left out of your introduction is that you Mm -hmm. actually worked for Tiffany & Company before you went to work for the Adams Papers editorial project. Do you mind telling us a bit about how and why you made the shift from sales professional to documentary editor and historian? 
Sure. Thanks for asking. I know it's a little bit of a plot twist on my CV to see that leap from Tiffany and Company to American Historian, but I have to say... I learned a lot of the skills that I use as a historian, as a sales professional. So kind of the idea of asking questions, keeping a narrative moving, changing direction when I have to based on the evidence or sources in front of me. From a practical standpoint, I began to give product modules, kind of training sessions on China, crystal, and sterling silver to new sales professionals. And this involved doing some digging into the Tiffany archives, which are wonderful to use and are located and open to researchers in Parsippany, New Jersey. And what I learned was kind of how the company involved itself in American historical events and really spoke to the cultural needs of the day with new products. And I became really interested in kind of the development of the company itself and how it fit into the different cities where it developed. Now, I worked at the Boston store and in helping Boston clients all day, I got to hear quite a bit about kind of their family networks and their relationships to the city. And I thought on kind of a spare summer, I would take a history of Boston class, which kind of launched me, thanks to the good professors at the Metropolitan College at Boston University, into a broader study of Boston churches and how they functioned in the American Revolution. Um, To do that kind of research, I came here to the Massachusetts Historical Society to work with particularly the King's Chapel and Old North Church records. And I suppose I had one of those aha moments in the reading room where I thought, gee, this is a great place to work, and I love history, and maybe they're hiring. (laughs) And fortunately, they were. So I started out in the library, and about nine months into my tenure there, an opening arose with the Adams Papers editorial project. And I really had no idea um, what a documentary editing project did, how it functioned. It was not something that was often brought up as a potential career path in grad school seminars. And I asked around. I learned what the project did. It seemed to complement my background in print journalism and history. And so fortunately, I applied. I've been happily doing documentary editing here in the Adams Papers ever since. Interesting. And I don't think I've ever thought about this before uh, you just launched into your description of, of what working at Tiffany's taught you about history. Um, Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, not only is Tiffany and Company a historic American company, but they Mm -hmm. deal in early American products of China, silver, Mm -hmm. and um, I forgot the other one you mentioned, but... uh, China, silver, and crystal. There's a great history of kind of commodity practice and exchange there, which I would encourage someone to do. (laughs) So you might you might have been a historian at heart all along and just hadn't recognized it till you took that history class. Exactly. I think that's kind of what happened. It did, sorry for the pun, crystallize exactly my <laughs> skill set and really teach me to train it on telling the story. And something that's really important as a sales professional that we, we were trained to do at Tiffany & Company is to kind of tell the story of the product, to translate and promote a certain experience that arises from interacting with it. And I think that's something that historians try very hard to do too, um, to kind of translate and pluck out these threads of experience that may not be immediately visible until you've pulled together the right kind of core of documents. Um, and and put it together for someone. That is what in, what we do try to do. So that fits in really <laughs> nice. So what about what is a documentary editing project, and what type of work do you do as an assistant editor? Sure. So the Adams Papers is fairly representative of most documentary editing projects, and our main goal is to create a faithful, accurate transcription of primary sources of the what, text that we hold what's a primary for scholars source? to use. I'm sorry? What is a primary source? By primary source, we're talking about the correspondence, the diaries, the first-person accounts, 
the visual culture that is manifested and preserved by the Adams family over the course of 10 generations. And here in the Adams papers, we have about a quarter of a million manuscript pages of material to work with. Um, the family very kindly brought the papers here on deposit at the turn of the 20th century. And by about 1954, they agreed to leave them with the Massachusetts Historical Society on the sole condition that they be published and shared. So since about 1956, we have published nearly 50 volumes related to the family. And we organize those primary sources a certain way, because otherwise it would just be an avalanche of, of material. And the way we've done it is to create three editorial tracks. And this is something you see a lot of documentary editors do in order to sort that much material. So the first track the diaries. That's incredibly important. That's where John Adams talks about kind of life as a, you know, brand new Harvard graduate where he's kind of stumbling along teaching at a boys school in Worcester, or it's where John Quincy really strenuously updates his diary every day for a half century. These are the things that we want to get out right away because it's someone speaking in his own words about his experience really at the heart of American power um, and out in the world. So that's the diary track. And within that track, we've recently moved to also include John Quincy's wife, Louisa Catherine, um, and to, to bring her voice into kind of the Adams family canon. So that's the diary track. And then the second thing that we do is a track of Adams family correspondence. And in this series, really, Abigail Adams is the star. This is the juicy correspondence between Abigail and her sisters. This is correspondence about what's going on in Quincy and Braintree. This tells us how an 18th century farm runs, what she planted, what she harvested, what she thought of the newspaper editors in the brand new capital and how they were treating her husband. So the family correspondence, which emphasizes the social history of the late 18th and early 19th century, is the second track. And then the third track, and this is the one that I primarily focus on, is the papers of John Adams. And these are the statesman's public papers. Here we deal with things like treaty negotiations, loan deals with foreign countries. To some extent, we'll deal with local politics. Right now, John Adams is out in the world. Um, I am living in London, 1785 to 1788, mentally. Um, so we, we have kind of John Adams at the center of that correspondence network. So that's kind of how we broke up the editing project in order to give the fullest possible account of the Adams family experience. Now, we have a pretty strict, I'd say, production schedule that we follow. So first, when we're creating a volume, and this is, again, something that most documentary editors would follow as a protocol, so it's a, a good example here. First, what we'll go, to do, go through do, and do is transcribe the documents. Then we'll go through and select the documents for publication. And with any given volume, we may pick about 400 to 600, usually about two-thirds of a batch of documents to be published. The ones that aren't published aren't forgotten about. We bring them in in our explanatory annotation to show what's going on, what's being read, exchanged, other news, other drafts, and we make a list of the omitted documents at the very end of the volume so that folks can go on Founders Online or look in our digital editions and also read the stories there. So once we've transcribed and we've selected the documents, our next step as documentary editors is to annotate the documents. And here it's really important to have a good, clear set of editorial directives. And the ones that we follow come from our founding editor-in-chief, Lyman Butterfield, but we have tweaked them over the years. We have edited our editorial directives to reflect changing trends in scholarship, new discoveries, digital resources that didn't exist maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago, which is fantastic. And annotation, the style of the Adams papers in terms of annotation is to be skeletal, direct and explanatory. So we don't, for example, overly annotate a congressman who is a passing cameo in an Abigail Adams letter. He will show up in the index instead. So we make choices about what to annotate. Something else that we do in order to create that very clear, accurate, faithful transcription of the text 
is something called tandem collation. And this is one of the perks of being kind of live-in researchers here at the Massachusetts Historical Society. We will have two sets of editors, one sitting with the original manuscript and one sitting with the transcription. And we will call out every letter, every word, every scrap of punctuation, every 18th century non-standard spelling, or every time Abigail says buisness or sparrygrass for asparagus, so that we know we're kind of getting the Adam's voice in our head and on the page. So we'll go through that tandem collation so that everything is directly um, coming from the Adam's voice. And that means we're kind of preserving it as a primary source when we share it with scholars. So we'll go through that. And then our last step that we do, which is probably the first thing readers flip to, is construct the index in-house. And this does mean I tend to think in backwards dependent clauses for a couple of months. But it's a very helpful thing to do. I, I really think that any graduate student or faculty member should try to make an index at least once because it will help you x-ray different themes that appear throughout the course of a volume. Sometimes we'll step back, as we did with volume 17 in the course of indexing, and say, I have listed pre-war debts a lot. It seems like that is a running theme we must pay more attention to. So that's kind of the big picture of putting a volume together for a documentary editing project. And then, of course, we're involved in other kind of projects from a public history standpoint to provide a digital research platform. So if you are on our website, on the MHS website, and you're on Adams Resources, you will be able to click on a family tree, on a timeline. You'll be able to look at biographies that let you meet the Adamses. Um, you can peruse our kind of online Adams catalog, which is a multi-document slip file of all known Adams documents here and in the world. And that'll help you shortcut those 608 reels of microfilm or at least navigate them a little more quickly. So the short answer is we put out volumes. And then the longer answer is we also support scholars interested in researching America through the Adams resources. Wow. A paper's editorial project is huge in its scope. But if we could, <laughs> you know, I guess because we could talk for days about about this kind of work. Let's just focus mm -hmm. on the documentary part. So you have this mm -hmm. three-part process where you issue basically the personal um the a personal volume in the form of a diary and then like the family papers or the um mm -hmm. the, the private family papers and then the official or state papers in those mm -hmm. three volumes. Yeah, exactly. And you mentioned that um part of the work is involved is to transcribe and annotate these volumes. So can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit more about what's involved with transcription and annotation? Sure. So our transcription, again, our goal is to be faithful to what's intended. And this is something where I embarked on a new realization um, that I hadn't dealt with before <laughs> working on a documentary editing project, which is how do you deal with drafts? What if there's more than one copy of a document? When I look at something, I have to be able to say that is the original, that is the recipient copy, that's the draft, that's a transcription, that's a letter book copy. What was made when? Um, so you really have to kind of deal with a universe of documents that's constantly mobile in your in your brain, I think, as a documentary editor. There's a kind of rigorous science to it in determining the steps of how someone created a letter. And within the papers of John Adams, here's an example. When John Adams is commissioned to serve as minister in Great Britain, he is working with a partner, Thomas Jefferson, commissioned at the same time to be American minister in Paris. So we have a lot of examples in the current volume of papers of John Adams, which I think we'll talk about in a minute, and also in the next one, um, in volume 18, where one of them will draft a letter. In some cases, they'll even encode it and make a fair copy in between and send a copy to Congress, send a copy to the recipient. 
But it's not a full diplomatic document, truly, until both of them sign it. So this gets into kind of the technical aspect of when we caption it, when we give it that title that says, the American commissioners to John Jay. Well, when does it become that document? At which stage? And which document are we going to choose to run? So you have a lot of choices when it comes to dealing with drafts and multiple versions. And you really have to start to think about the intent of the author versus what the recipient acts on. So we really have to know, well, Jefferson in the spring of 1785 has a brand new toy. He has a letter press that's brought to his home in Paris. And so I know that there are press copies of many of his letters, helpfully digitized and available by the Library of Congress. But John Adams doesn't have a letter press. He does, however, because he lacks a really steady salary for secretarial help in this period, have kids. And so he often has his children, John Quincy, or his daughter, Abigail II or Nabby, doing much of the secretarial work. So it's their hand in the letter books. They're privy to some of these really high-level diplomatic dealings that are going on. But then we have to make a choice. Do we go with a letter book copy? Do we go with this? So these are, it's one of those things I hadn't really thought about. I think until I did documentary editing, which is, well, which version am I citing and why is it important that I chose that one? Because it tells me something about how the document was created. So I guess that's something that with transcription, we're constantly thinking about, you know, do I need to transcribe the letter copy or can I go with the one that I have? So when you try to answer the question a bit about transcription, sorry. Yes. Oh, I was just going to say, so what you're saying, so when you transcribe, you not only have to read all of these documents in their original Mm -hmm. printed or drafted hand or Mm -hmm. print, but you have to decide which ones to transcribe into type that make it into the book to actually place, you know, do I use this one written by John Quincy? Do I use this one written by John? Do I use this one that was printed in in the newspapers? Which ones make the volume? So it's not just actually copying their hand and typing it out into your computer uh, for the book. It's comparing these documents as well. That's exactly right, Liz. You've got to know how to deal with multiple versions of the same document. And this gets to the second part of your question, which is, what about annotation? So annotation is a helpful place. It's a good part of the editorial apparatus, kind of what the backbone, the architecture of a volume is. Annotation is a good place to deal with other drafts. So if John Adams is drafting something important in his letter book, as he does when he meets King George III of Britain for the first time, we want to compare what he writes in the letter book as a draft in the annotation with what eventually is read by Jay and Americans about that very famous interview. So it becomes a question of, well, how can we talk about this? Annotation gives us a place to talk about it. But annotation is also the baseline for data, right? So if you are identifying a person, a place, a book, that's the place to do it. Expanding a little bit on drafts is another opportunity that annotation has for an editor. Wow, this is a lot of work. Just to give us a scope of of how big of a project or projects these are, do you happen to know how many documentary editing projects there are? And, you know, how are they funded? Um, or I guess rather than how are they funded, mm-hmm. why are they funded? You know, how do they help us better understand the people's places and events of the past? Sure. So I would have said, if you asked me this question maybe five years ago, I'd say, oh, maybe 100 documentary editing projects. But now, kind of thanks to digital additions, to just really major kind of, (coughs) excuse me, really major advances in software, I'd say easily more. I'd say well over 100. If you are on the Association for Documentary Editing's website, which is kind of the standard professional organization, um, it, it's something to see how many are added. Um, it, it's really interesting to kind of kind of see. And most projects rely on a team of, you know, maybe 10 to 15 editors at most. That's certainly true of some of the other Founding Father projects that we work with. Sorry. But it's, it's certainly a very much a core of editors, usually a mix of people with a background in American studies, American history, journalism, kind of all walks of life in terms of 
of who works on it. As for funding, most projects like us have a mixture of private and federal funding, um, and that's something that is part of the public history world, I think, and one of the, the real challenges is to keep that interest. And fortunately, I have to say, most people are interested in still listening to John Adams and hearing what he has to say, and to Abigail, too. Um, so we've been quite fortunate in that regard so far. Great. Well, we have the curse here. It's a good curse to have in that there's so much we could talk about, and we could probably yeah. talk about documentary editing for ages. But we should mm-hmm. also really talk about John Adams. And mm-hmm. um, as you mentioned before, the Adams Papers editorial project has just published volume 17 of the papers of John Adams, which contains his papers and correspondence from April through November 1785. So before we get into the nitty gritty of that, can you mm-hmm. provide us with a brief overview of who John Adams was and what his accomplishments up to April 1785 were? Sure. So John Adams, by the time we meet him um, in this volume, is already known for, I would say, the most important things he's known for in this period. He has defended the British soldiers in the Boston Massacre trials. In 1780, he has drafted the Massachusetts State Constitution. He has done his tenure in the Continental Congress. And in this period, he is nearly a decade out of his native Boston, right? So he has been off as an Anglo-American peace commissioner. He is coming off really a banner year, 1782. He secured recognition of the United States and the Netherlands. He's contracted the first of four loans from Amsterdam bankers. He signed a treaty of amity and commerce with the Netherlands. And he's coming off, just as we meet him, kind of the, the glow of the definitive peace treaty with Britain. And he has just been appointed first American minister to the court of St. James in London. So he's he's been abroad for eight years. His family has finally joined him um, just outside Paris in a toy. Abigail is with him. It's a happy time for the family because they're somewhat re- reunited for the first time. And he is best known kind of in this period for being an American representative in the company of Franklin Jefferson Jay and really a leading legal voice at home. So that's kind of set him up for this. And this is the job that he has been angling for, for the longest time to be the first American minister to Great Britain. And he really thinks that his previous commissions have kind of made him the de facto minister. So when he does finally get news in the spring of 1785, that he's officially gotten the job, he can't pack fast enough for London. And he's really excited about restoring Anglo-American trade, about resolving some of the issues that are left lingering from the Anglo-American peace treaty. And I think he's kind of curious to see the British ministry up close. I mean, here's something that he had a very quick trip to London a few years earlier, but he's he's really not experienced British culture. So he's a provincial New England lawyer thrown out into the world who has ably met a job he never really was prepared for beyond reading, which is to be an American statesman. And this is his big chance to really restore faith in a brand new country in front of the eyes of Europe. So John Adams, he gets his dream job up to that point in April 1785. He's finally coming to the, you know, face to face with the British Empire, something that he helped lead a rebellion against. Mm -hmm. So let's take us into April through November of 1785. What type of work did the United States Congress order Adams to undertake as the first minister to Great Britain? So his job is to create a stable Anglo-American commercial relationship, one that's truly reciprocal. And this is where the dream job sours, because the British ministry, under the tenuous control of a brand new prime minister, 26-year-old William Pitt the Younger, is not interested in 
any such opportunity. They would rather maintain the pre-war channels that things have drifted back to. And the very things that Adams wants, that he's tasked to negotiate, more particularly to get the British to evacuate those frontier posts, to get compensation or restoration for the property and slaves seized when the British evacuated, and to settle the payment of pre-war debts. Those three things recur over and over in the letters. He signals to John Jay and others, these are the things we need to settle, and he hits a brick wall. He is, as he says, when he meets with the foreign minister, the Marquis of Carmarthen, he's met with silence. He writes memorials, he sends letters, he does his due diligence making the diplomatic rounds, nothing. They are not interested. So he has this dream job, and he has a great mission, but it turns out to be not quite as expected. And it's certainly not, I think, what he had hoped for his next stage of his career. Often in biographies about John Adams, this tends to be a bit of an underwritten or undersung period. And in fact, this period between April and November of 1785 forecasts how life is going to be for the next three years. It is an exercise in frustration. Why didn't England want to treat with Adams? Why does Carmarthen, you know, meet him with silence? Is it You know, do they feel that Adams doesn't have any power or it's just hard feelings over losing the war? Why are they so? Well, that's exactly it. That's that's reason one, right? So they do doubt that he has any powers to negotiate. He is representing a government with a very weak set of articles of confederation to back it. Even John Adams says, these articles, they are not as strong as they could be. They don't give us a strong central government. We don't look powerful enough to negotiate treaties or agreements of any kind. So that's reason one. And reason two is that the British ministry is tied up elsewhere. For Pitt, this is a brand new coalition that he's formed. He is young in power. He is dealing with kind of a full-on assault from Ireland in terms of economic independence and similar arguments, and he is completely distracted by that. And it's to their advantage to kind of keep trade regulated by the old orders in council to say, no, let it drift back to pre-war channels, and we don't really need to renegotiate. So they're distracted. They have an empire. As you say, John Adams is face-to-face with the British Empire, and I think this is one of the moments where he sees it is really an empire. There are vast holdings that he has not fully thought through how to deal with trade in the Indies or whether it's you know trade with French colonies. This is really the moment, I think, where America realizes what it's like to operate no longer as a colony in an imperial world, in an Anglo-French imperial world. And it is a hard shock, I think. It is, it is not an easy transition economically. Sure. And because they were unprepared, you know, they didn't form a government that would assist Mm -hmm. them with that. You know, they are not really the United Colonies in anything but name or United States in anything but name. Um, As you can see in the articles, a confederation with the, you know, all Mm -hmm. laws must be passed unanimously. And of course, South Carolina Mm -hmm. and Massachusetts have different interests. So, um, you know, if the if the United Kingdom or Great Britain is going to negotiate with the United States, it probably wants to if it's going to negotiate, negotiate with independent regions or individual regions. Yeah, and this is where his kind of mission, as he's been dictated to do it, he can't follow through on. He just simply is not empowered to um, deal with them in a way that he wants to. And it seems to turn again and again on the question of settlement of the pre-war debts. And neither side can reach an agreement on how to do this. And to be fair, John Adams kind of looks around for help. He meets with Scottish industrialists and bankers and ask them how to handle things. There's a brief moment where it seems like maybe they'll be able to intervene with the British ministry and help that fizzles. And this happens to be at a time when Britain's own economic structures in a state of flux, as is France. So he is dealing with a Britain that is also negotiating the first Anglo-French commercial treaty in 100 years. So they have some very distinct um, goals of their own that they are mending on the continent, and they do not need to bother with a former colony's pleas for a reciprocal structure. They have kind of bigger fish to fry, I think, is simply the case. And I think John Adams is a bit surprised by that. 
Um, I, I think that that kind of takes him aback. They do, however, I think within the British ministry, understand that America poses a bit of an economic threat, that it will be something they will have to keep an eye on. And that's kind of interesting to see um, that little thread running a little bit through the correspondence with Carr Martin. And this is one of those things where documents are wonderful, but they don't tell us everything. Um, when I was, just as a side note, when I was doing the selection for this particular volume, um, by sheer luck, I happened to be in London for the rare book school at the University of London and went over to see where the first legation in Grosvenor Square was actually maintained by John Adams, which is now Tony Blair's headquarters, I would point out. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful spot. But the interesting thing about it is number eight, later number nine, Grosvenor Square, is that Carmarthen is at number two Grosvenor Square. And Frederick Lord North is just a little bit on the opposite side of the square. So while the documents are wonderful to see them flying back and forth between the foreign minister of Britain and the American minister to kind of get the sense of the exchange, a lot happened when they dined together that we don't have. So it's always helpful to kind of walk the place where the words came from and say, oh, so that letter actually did get to you the same day, but you probably didn't reply. These are the little things where I think it helps to connect kind of words and experience as much as possible possible and to walk the site when you can. So it's one of those things where you think, oh, perhaps he and Carmarthen had a longer talk about it during the course of their three years of dinner together. Um, it's one of those things where the documents just can't give you everything, but you really want them to, or you want to eavesdrop on that dinner, right? Yeah, definitely. I've been in many of those situations. It's like, oh, I mm -hmm. wish you would just tell me a bit more. Mm -hmm. So I know the Confederation period economy it's a mess and there are books written mm -hmm. on it. Um, but since you brought it up, can you briefly tell us, you know, what the repayment of debt issue was, um, why it's left over from the Treaty of Paris 1783 negotiations and whether John Adams experienced any success in resolving the issues left over from the Treaty of Paris 1783 that Congress has tasked him to deal with? Well, there's sure there's a great deal of confusion, actually, about how to pay the debts, where to pay the debts. Can you get any money or restoration for good seas, say, during the occupation of Boston? And this is something that plays out a little later on. This will play out in volume 18, where he's petitioned by really, I'd say, constituents in Massachusetts of all <laughs> patriot, loyalist, all political stripes. And he has to write back and often say, you know, I am minister and as a government appointed minister, my diplomatic instructions do not extend to getting involved in personal debts and petitions. And this gets a little awkward for him because people constantly hope he'll intervene and kind of take their case. You know, they'd like John Adams for the defense. Um, and he's, he's very kind of tied up because he can't help them and he can't help them personally and he can't help them professionally and he can't help them as a minister. And one of the big questions that kind of comes to the fore is, well, what are we claiming? I mean, how, how do we value any slaves taken? So this becomes kind of a question of how property is described, how value is assigned to it. And ultimately, you're right, he doesn't get anywhere. He cannot get the ministry to respond. And it's it's, I think, one of the things that he is most um, perturbed about by the spring of 1787. He is ready to come home. He is hugely disturbed by news of Shays' rebellion. He is upset about the lack of currency, about courts being closed. He fears that that frame of government, that structure that he espoused in the Massachusetts State Constitution has suddenly become vulnerable and that this kind of ripple effect of Boston ports being glutted with European merchants work, and then Boston merchants kind of leaning on Western farmers, and Western farmers in the stranglehold of debt leading to Shays' Rebellion. This is the kind of thing that worries him, and want, he really wants to return home. So he knows he can't resolve it. I think he, he thinks that if he is back on the ground in Massachusetts, he'll be able to have more influence, and certainly with the first two volumes of his defense of the Constitution's rolling out, he thinks that this is a way that maybe he can have a voice in the struggle. Wow. So he can't resolve the debt issue. He's probably feeling uh, 
pretty low about that, you know, as a preview into the next volume. And these debts that he's trying to help resolve, these are personal debts that people, you know, merchants in America have mm-hmm. taken, you know, have acquired from merchants in London mm-hmm. um, for mm-hmm. goods that they had shipped while colonists. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. All right. I know we have already talked a lot already, but I, I have to ask <laughs> two questions. Um, sure. All right. So 1785, John Adams, first minister to Great Britain. One of the formalities of serving as a foreign minister or an ambassador today is being presented to the head of state. So we have to know, how did King George III receive Adams? Was his majesty polite? Was he rude? Did Adams actually talk to the king? Can you describe the scene for us? So this is actually, I'm so glad you asked because this is one of my favorite sets of documents that we have in the volume. And it's one of those where you think, what's going to happen? Even though you kind of know how the movie goes, but you still want to watch. So in April of 1785, when he first gets an inkling that he might get the job, John Adams is worried about how to be presented to the king, which takes some doing because John Adams doesn't, I think, tremble that easily when it comes to matters of duty and etiquette. And he writes to a colleague, the Dutch minister, and says, well, how exactly do you do it? Is there something I'm supposed to do? How do I respond? And so he gets kind of like a preview. You will be ushered in by a master of ceremonies to St. James Palace. And this is exactly what happens in June of 1785. He's ushered up to just kind of just outside the king's bedchamber, which is the king's closet, which is where ministers are received. And he's still very nervous. He's gone through all this rigmarole. He's very dressed up. And he has servants in a carriage and is brought upstairs. And he's standing outside the room waiting to be shown in to meet the king. And he says, you may well suppose that I was the focus of all eyes. So he's pretty nervous. And he, he in fact, says that once he's ushered in, he goes in, he makes his three reverences. You make one at the door, another about halfway, and then one when you're right before the presence of the king. And then he kind of launches into a speech, which is a pretty short speech for John Adams. Um, But it's very much one of reconciliation. He asks that they can restore the old good nature and the old good humor between people who, even though they're kind of separated by an ocean, have the same language, a similar religion, and kindred blood. And this is his kind of salvo um, that he puts forth. But he's, he's very affected. And to him, this moment standing before the king, this is really what marks the end of the American Revolution and the beginning of independence. This is the moment where you have an American emissary, a rebel leader, someone who signed the declaration, standing in front of a king who had said just two years earlier he would never, ever recognize such a thing. So the king listens to him, and it's at this moment when I turned in my annotation to think about George himself. And the thing is, he and George are about the same age. George is maybe three years older, which is something I hadn't really thought about before. So the king listens, and he says, really kind of a a welcome to the reconciliation. He, he kind of says, I was the last to consent to that separation, but since it's been made, I'll be the first to meet the friendship of the United States as an independent power. Let the circumstances that you mentioned, you know, language, religion, and blood, have their natural and full effect. And so John Adams takes this down and takes it in, and you think that the interview is over. And this is the point where when we we're reading it in collation, and I was reading John Adams' account of it, I thought, oh, well, and now we're done. But then there's a little more, because the king, having done the routine task of welcoming the minister, says, oh, and were you just in from France? And he says, yes. And the king tries to sort of catch him out. And he says, um, some people say that you are not the most attached to the manners of France. And here John Adams gets a little flustered. He gets a little nervous because there's no good way to respond. He doesn't want to look overly eager to embrace either country. He is American at heart. And so he says that uh, he wouldn't deny the truth of that, but he says that he has no attachments but to my own country. So meaning he's American through and through. And he says, the king replies, quick as lightning, an honest man will never have any other. So this is their first exchange, right? 
do we have some boundaries that have been tested, some reconciliation that's been attempted, and this is kind of the relationship as it exists. And that's kind of their first back and forth. So he, he retreats, he makes his three backward bows, <clears throat> he goes out of St. James Palace, and he's He's very taken with the idea that there are servants who are running ahead of him, roaring for Mr. Adams' servants and Mr. Adams' carriage. This kind of aristocratic, diplomatic rigmarole and ceremony is what will probably peeve him the most over the next three years. And it's far out of his experience as a, a provincial New England lawyer. So that's kind of his experience. He meets the queen about a week later. She is a bit briefer in her interview. She asked mainly if he's found a place to live. Um, but she does welcome Abigail and Nabby to the court as well. So they have kind of an interesting first exchange. There's a moment of welcome, but of course not welcome back, um, but kind of welcome to this world where the British Empire is still very much alive and functioning. Now, the interesting thing about this whole exchange is that John Adams has to record it, right? People are waiting, just like you were eager to hear about it. People are eager to hear about it back in America. And he's worried, very worried that it will be misreported or some version of it that's too candid will be laid before Congress. So he drafts the whole report to John Jay in his letter book. And then he makes out a fair copy of it. And then he encodes it in an alphanumeric nomenclator code so that when it does get to America, we have a couple of different drafts as documentary editors we can draw from. And we say, well, in the letter book, the first time he said, George kind of had a German accent. Well, he took that part out. <clears throat> or he says, and then the king said this. And the parts where the king is talking, those are the parts that John Adams agonizes over how to report because he wants to get it just right. So this is one of those moments where it's really fun as a documentary editor to kind of have a lot of drafts because you get to reconstruct how he recorded this interview and shared it with Americans back home. So that's kind of the the launch of his relationship with George, which is fairly cordial for three years. He'll see him at diplomatic circles. Um, Abigail comes to court and she has quite a lot to say about, to, about it to her sisters and to her nieces. Um, and you really kind of get a fantastic perspective from Abigail about London life and culture. Wow. You, you do a lot of awesome work as documentary editors. I mean, you painted a full scene of what it was like for John Adams to meet George III. Uh, it was a lot more gracious than I imagined, but by comparing mm -hmm. the documents, you're able to paint a much more full picture than they probably even had in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's fantastic. Well, Sarah, I really appreciate your time today. We have already gone way over our normal 30 minutes. <laughs> it's been um, a but pleasure. <laughs> but before we go, it's time for the time warp. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Yay! Now, <laughs> now this is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. All right, are you ready? Ready. Okay. So in your opinion, what might have happened if Congress had ordered Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Jay, or some other American to serve as the first minister to Great Britain instead of John Adams. Do you think any of these other men might have been able to resolve the United States' outstanding issues with Great Britain? Nope. I think that would be my short answer. I think that there's a moment, actually, where John Adams asked the same question of himself. Could anyone else pull this off? Because I am not able to fulfill what I've been asked to do. And he asked this question really twice, once before he even has gotten the job. He writes a letter in February 1783 where he does something that I think is kind of genius from an, a modern MBA standpoint. He wants this job as minister to Great Britain, but he's not going to particularly put himself forward for it. So he writes a letter to the president of Congress laying out all the qualities you would need to have if you were to be a minister to Great Britain. And he says, you know, classical learning, someone who is not vulnerable to party politics, someone who will not cause jealousy and factionalism, something, someone perhaps with a legal degree and some knowledge of 
diplomatic duty and economic frameworks in the world. So he very cannily describes himself, um, and this will come back to haunt him a little bit later on. So that's the first time he kind of wonders, am I right for the job? And he does the thing that I think anyone facing a blank page trying to make a CV does, which is, let me gather my skills together and see if they suit this job. So he wonders it first before he gets the job. And then in kind of the, the latter part of his tenure in London, he writes to John Jay and he says, I don't know if you're planning to replace me, but I really don't know, even if you find some incredibly angelic, gifted diplomat, I don't know if they could do this job either. So on either side of his tenure, he asked himself your time warp question. I can tell you from the documents that we edit that that's exactly what he's wondering too. And his feeling is no, my feeling is in line with his. I think that Franklin, while incredibly talented in dealing with the French court, perhaps would not have been able to parlay that same kind of charm in London. Jefferson is perfectly suited for Versailles. This is something where his aesthetic influence and his kind of cosmopolitan nature is well suited to deal with the machinations of Versailles in general. And I think John Jay really, has, he's strong in Spain, of course, but he is doing a really first-rate job as much as he can as Secretary of Foreign Affairs back home in New York, which is what's needed. Um, so I think each of them fill a role that's needed at the time, um, but they are certainly aware of their own shortcomings, and they're always trying to improve each other and themselves in the truest 18th century sense. Well, I guess John Adams did what a lot of us would do today, which is just did the best he could and and try to make headway where he can. So hopefully he, he does have, uh, I will say one thing, although it's, it's not a completely lost cause this period in his career. He excels at moments of cultural diplomacy. He is very effective in meeting with the Archbishop of Canterbury and easing the way for Episcopal ordination, which is something we hadn't known really going into the volume that was new to us. He's incredibly effective in helping Thomas Barclay secure the, Mer the Moroccan-American Treaty of 1786-87, of kind of guiding him through that. Although, of course, he and Jefferson are less productive in trying to ransom sailors who are seized in Algiers. Um, he does also, I think John Adams, have a very um, stout-hearted sense of support for American artists and writers. He complains to Mercy Otis Warren, of all people, that nothing American sells here when he's talking about London. But he is ardent in his promotion of people like Trumbull, Stewart, Copley, Humphreys. These are names that we often associate with kind of the nascent national American arts and letters in this period. And he really will write any introduction, will buy a painting, will sit for them, will read their odes, is really strong in cultural diplomacy in a way that we did not realize until we began to gather documents for this next volume. Wow, that's, a, that's great. Uh, thank you for sharing all that with us. Now, before we conclude, aside from graduating with your PhD in January, early congratulations on that, by the way, uh, what you. is on the horizon for you? What should we expect from you next? Well, we'll still be here producing Adam's Papers volumes come January, and we'll be quite involved into diving into volume 18. For me, I'll be working on my book manuscript, which is based on my dissertation, which is a story of Religion in One American Family. Yes, it's the Adamses from 1583 to 1927. Particularly, I'm interested in how they interpret American religion and how they interact with different religions in the world. And of course, I'll still be blogging for the Junto slash the Jinto, however you readers like to enjoy it, um, on all things related to public history, documentary editing, and digital projects. Great. And so where is the best place um, for people to find more information about you, the Adams Papers editorial project, and how to get in contact with you? So there's two ways to reach us. I would recommend our website, masshist.org backslash Adams. We do love a good reference question, so please let us know if you're working on an Adams-related project. And otherwise, I'd say please keep reading our blog, The Junto. Great. And I'll include links to all of those uh, sites in our, in our show notes. Great. So thank, thank you very you. much for joining us today.
Thank you, Liz. Sometimes we forget that the United States wasn't always a leading nation in the world. But the frustrations that John Adams met with as the U.S. minister to Great Britain serve as a good reminder that the nation owes a lot to the efforts of Adams, his colleagues, and their successors for the work to raise the international stature of the United States. It is also amazing and a bit overwhelming to realize how much work documentary editors put into each volume of published documents. I, for one, am grateful for their hard work because their efforts make it possible for anyone to access the past from a firsthand perspective. Now, you can find information about Sarah, the Adams Papers editorial project, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, which you'll find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 007. And finally, if you could do one thing for me, I would greatly appreciate it. If you have yet to rate this podcast, I hope you'll do so soon, because your rating will help us keep Ben Franklin's world visible and findable for other history lovers. If you give Ben Franklin's World a five-star rating and leave a review, I'll be sure to thank you by mentioning your name on an upcoming episode. To rate and review Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history, just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash iTunes or benfranklinsworld.com slash Stitcher. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.